to business. We appreciate you supporting our local business. That's very cool. Um, all right, so we'll get started. It's about 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get rolling here on peppers. Uh, so hot, so growing peppers is, is very easy, actually. Um, I think um, uh, a lot of people start with tomatoes, and tomatoes are pretty easy, too. They do require a little bit of different things, and I've talked about tomatoes um, in another seminar, so if you want to learn more about tomatoes, you can check out all of our seminars on our web page as, well as, um, as well as on our Facebook page. It's a great way to kind of go back and, and review some of the topics that we've talked about before. I'll talk about soil a little bit. We did a whole soil seminar on just talking about soil, uh, but we'll touch on all the topics as it pertains to peppers today. Um, and, uh, and nothing's better than a fresh pepper. Um, they're very healthy. It's a very healthy snack. Um, it's a great way to add spice to a lot of dishes. There's so many different ways to use them. Um, they're very rich in vitamin A and C. Um, so they're very healthy for you. Um, it's a, they're like I was mentioning just a second ago. They're a little bit easier um, than than tomatoes actually because they don't have as many pest or disease issues, um, and they're a little bit smaller of a plant, so they're a little bit easier to contain. Uh, you can grow a, a few more. We'll talk about all the different areas that you can grow them in your yard um, and different ways to grow them in pots and raised beds and different things. Um, so they're actually very easy. You know, some tomato plants can get you know ten feet tall. So it's how do I contain that? How do I manage that? Um, peppers, most peppers get in a range of somewhere between two to five feet um, and about two to three feet wide. So they're not humongous plants. Uh, they're pretty easy. You don't have to worry. I'll talk about a little bit about staking them. Um, but um, but that, that's kind of what's so nice about them is, is they're very easy to grow. Um, but some people maybe have not been successful with them and hopefully you'll learn something today on, on how you can be more successful with pepper growing. If you're a first timer and you've never done it before and you wanna learn how to do it, that's what we're here to teach you as well. So, um, so kinda wanna go through the topics that we'll be talking about here. Uh, we'll be talking about a little bit about planning, how to plan, location, soil, the seeds versus plants, um, when to plant them, uh, mulching, is that, is that something we need to do? Uh, staking your peppers and how to prune them, um, and then insect and disease issues, fertilization, watering, and then I'll go through all the different types of peppers. I got a lot to show you. So I'll kind of run through those topics uh, as quickly as I possibly can, uh, making sure that you get all the information that I can give you. Um, and then we'll go through all the different types of peppers that we carry because there's a lot of different types out there and some of you might not know all the different types um, or might wanna try some different ones that you've tried in the past. Um, so let's start with planting. I always talk about this when talking about vegetable gardening or any kind of edible gardening is, is take a, just a, a few minutes to kind of plan and think about, you know, your family. If, you, if you've got a family of four, how many peppers are you going to eat? Uh, the worst thing that can ha happen is as your peppers or vegetable plants mature, um, are you going to be able to consume all of that? And if you're not, do you have a plan of pickling or freezing or different types of drying? We'll talk about drying. Uh, peppers. So, um, you know, think about those things. Just a little bit of planning goes a long way because the worst thing is when you get to the point of, of where you're starting to harvest your, your edible plants um, that you have too much. Now, it's not a bad thing. You know, you can give it away to neighbors. You can give it away to friends and family. Um, you know, it, it, during these times, you can you can just let them know, hey, I'm going to bring over a basket of them uh, and put them on your doorstep. So it's a great time to be out in the yard. Uh, it's a great time to exercise, and, and that's a great thing that we can do right now. So just take a little bit of time to plan and prepare and think about the different types of varieties that you want and the different types uh, and how many you need. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along, but just take a minute and plan. That's all I kind of, I always kind of suggest that when doing vegetable gardening. Um, so then location. This is probably one of the most key things about peppers is sun. And I'll mention it multiple times throughout this uh, throughout this seminar. They need as much sun as you can possibly get them. So I, if you've watched my herb seminar or my tomato seminar or even my vegetable garden, uh, the, 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 the victory garden seminar on how to grow your own food, um, sometimes you can get away with a little bit less sun. You know, four to five, six hours, you can kind of still grow some edible plants. Peppers really do the best in as much sun as you can possibly get them, six to eight hours. So typically I say you can fudge that a little bit, you can kind of you know get around it, You know it's okay if they get a little bit of shade in the afternoon, a little bit of shade in the morning. Peppers need as much sun as you can possibly get them. So six to eight hours of full sun, I mean they need it, they want it. Um, peppers need it to, in order to, to set their fruit, they need it in order to be healthy and thrive and not have disease or insect issues. 
they, they just really do need as much sun as you, as you possibly can get them. Um, now, if, again, that six to eight hours can come in different time frames. Um, if you get morning sun to about four o'clock, three o'clock, that's okay. That's a good amount of sun. If you get sun from 10 to six, that's your eight hours of sun. Six to eight hours is what you need. So it doesn't have to be, you know, all day sun. Um, that would be very difficult in most of our neighborhoods where we have big trees. Uh, but it is my, my, my best um, uh, advice is, um, is give them as much sun as you possibly can. Um, I have grown them in, in a slightly shady location before, and they just never, never produce. They just don't. So you got to give them as much sun as you possibly can. That's the most important thing, I think, with peppers. Give them sun. Um, all right. So then we'll talk about the different types of ways that you can grow them in different types of locations. So raised beds, great option. Of course, raised beds are designed to allow the soil to heat up a little bit quicker. You can also add whatever soil it is that you want to that mix. So that's what's so cool about raised bed gardening is uh, the growing media. You get to control that. So you get to add compost that you want, or you get to add the perlite or the peat moss or the vermiculite. There's lots of different things that you can use to, to, to change your soil and make your soil different and make your own mix. And we can help you with that. So if you don't know how much soil you need, um, we can help you. If you get your length and your width and your depth, we can, we can help you uh, figure out exactly how much soil you need. Uh, you can do a bulk, you can do a bag. We have raised bed mixes, we have potting soils, lots of different ways of, of amending your soil um, in your raised beds. But that's what's so cool about raised beds is soil heats up a little bit quicker. You can get a little bit of an earlier start. Um, and, and so that's why raised beds are, are so popular. Um, so raised beds, and then of course in containers, you can grow them in so many different containers. Peppers are, so, are, are, are a lot more compact plants than tomato plants. So they're easier to grow in a, in a container. Um, so a three gallon, a 10 inch pot, 12 inch pot, you can grow a very nice pepper plant in that, especially if you look for ones that might get a little bit smaller than your typical you know, five to six foot tall pepper. Um, so lots of different options there, lots of different ways to grow them. You can grow them in clay, ceramic, plastic pots, uh, buckets, You know, make sure they have drainage. We'll talk about that when we get to the watering and the soil, um, but, but make sure they have drainage. And then of course you can grow them directly in the ground. So that's kind of what I want to spend just a quick minute on is, is how to grow them in the ground here because a lot of us do grow um, peppers right in, in our yard, right in our vegetable garden or even in the landscape. They're a pretty landscape plant, really. Um, you know, I always talk about foodscaping. You know, if you got some space in your landscape and, and you want to add some peppers and some edible plants, they make great ornamental plants, really, um, and something that you can eat on as well. Um, so what you want to do is amend your soil. Our soil typically tends to be clay-based. Um, so our clay soil we definitely want to um, uh, amend that. Um, and, and so uh, with a clay soil, it's very thick. It can stay very waterlogged sometimes when we have heavy rains like we just did. Um, it can stay wet for a long time and you wanna amend that with perlite. So I grabbed perlite just so you can see it because I know I talk about it a lot, but perlite are those, I don't know if you can hear that, but those little white styrofoam things that you see in potting soil. Um, it's not styrofoam. Um, it's actually a mineral that's fired up to such an intense heat that it pops but it lasts in the soil for a very long time and it improves drainage and peppers love good drained soil. So well-drained soil. So you wanna amend your clay soil with perlite and then compost. Compost is gonna add nutrients. It's gonna help break up that clay. It's gonna to continue to decompose, release nutrients into the soil um, and, and just loosen up your soil. So if you have clay soil, it's compost and perlite. That's what we're always gonna recommend. Um, it's the best for, this ha for the Hampton Roads area. Um, so that's how you would want to amend your soil if you're planting in the ground. Um, for raised beds, I talked about how you can you know, choose your different mixes. If you're growing in pots, you have to use a potting soil. You must use potting soil. Do not use a garden soil. Do not use straight compost and don't use straight topsoil. Those will become muddy. Topsoil and compost will become muddy. Compost is continually to decompose and when decomposition happens, soil heats up to a degree that can hurt the root system. So you definitely wanna use a potting soil. Potting soil is, is, is a mix of perlite, vermiculite, compost, peat moss, lots of different things, depends on the soil. Of course, we have a great one here, our natural and organic potting soil, our all-purpose potting soil. They're always a great deal. They're one cubic foot bags, $9.99. Buy two, get one free. Uh, so you can always get a great deal on those. So you can get three cubic feet of soil for $20. It's a great deal all the time. Um, so that's not just on sale. That's just a great deal all the time. Uh, but if you're growing in any kind of container, you want to use potting soil. 
So I talk about earth boxes a lot. Earth boxes are very, very popular. It's a great way to grow vegetables. Um, and so that you would want to use a potting soil in a clay pot, terracotta pot, uh, plastic pot, ceramic pot, potting soil. Make sure it's got a drain hole. Make sure that the water can get through it. But that's what potting soils are designed for is so that they won't become waterlogged and they allow drainage and allow the root system to take. So use potting soil in, in your pots. All right. So then we'll talk about let's talk about seeds versus plants uh, with seeds. Um, if you if you haven't started your seeds for your pepper plants, it might be a little bit too late. Seeds have been difficult to get this year. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, um, uh, we, we just, you know, hard to get seeds, seed factories or seed companies that make seeds um, and package them, package them at, at, a, at, a, at a purchase time. Um, and they have just been overrun. And so then shipping, of course, with everything that's going on has been difficult. Um, so you're probably having a hard time trying to find pepper seeds. Uh, we do have some, we don't have a huge selection, but we do have a huge selection of plants. And that's kind of what I'm going to recommend right now is to go ahead and get your just starter plants, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, but seeds do take some time. Pepper plants can take seven to 10 days to germinate. Soil temperature needs to be in that 70 to 80 degree range um, to, to get your seeds to germinate. They can take some time and then you got to acclimate them. So if you are doing them from seed um, and you've got your seeds and they're still inside, that's good. You kind of want to keep them inside. You might be able to start taking them out soon. We'll talk about temperatures here in a minute. Um, but you definitely want to uh, acclimate them to the outdoor areas. You know, growing indoors to get your seeds started is a great way of doing it the best way. Um, but when you take them straight out to direct sunlight, they're not ready for that. So you got to acclimate them. You got to take them out, you know, put them in a shady spot. You might bring them in during the night, kind of do that for a few days, then leave them in the shade overnight and then start to work them out into a sunnier location. Uh, so you don't get that shock on a, a new seedling. Um, now plants are an easy way to do it. Um, seed packets, you know, can sometimes have 50 to 150 seeds in them. Do you need that many pepper plants? Um, so, you know, I always say, you know, at least, you know, with a pepper plant, you know, if you've got your pepper plant right here, then, you know, you're going to be successful. It's already growing, um, and it's ready to go. So I love, you know, the starter plants versus seed. It's a very easy thing to do. And if you're itching to get out there in the garden, I definitely would recommend the plants. You can pick from a lot of different varieties. You can get six different varieties. You don't have to worry about trying to start your seeds. Um, and especially now, um, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of get, get that started. Um, okay, so now let's talk about, so that was kind of the seeds versus the plants. Let's talk about when to plant. Um, so some of you probably have already planted peppers. I know we've had them for weeks now. Um, and, and some of you might've already put your pepper plants in the ground um, and that's okay. Um, but usually we recommend May 1st to May 15th, which is what we're in. Today is May 1st. Um, so if you haven't planted your peppers, still a great time to kind of think about it. You know, you don't have to jump, you don't have to feel like you're, you're behind schedule. You're actually not. Um, most of us that have planted our peppers probably have noticed that they've done absolutely nothing. <laughs> and that's because the soil temperatures are just not warm enough. Um, and so soil temperature needs to get up to that 65, 70 degree range before we really start to see those peppers start to grow. And that's going to be some time. I mean, when we've got nighttime temperatures that aren't consistently above 60, then you really don't want to plant your peppers. But a lot of us have. It's okay. Most of them are going to be fine. I mean, if you planted them, you know, four weeks ago, you might see a little bit of cold damage on the leaves. They should be okay. They should bounce back. But most of us, if we have planted our peppers, have probably noticed absolutely nothing happening to them. They haven't grown at all. Now that can shock them. It's hard for harder for them to come back from that. Um, but they should be fine. Our soil temperatures haven't dropped, so it's not like they've gone back and forth. They're just slowly going up. Um, and we're, we still got another couple of weeks of cool weather. Um, so we're, we're just, we're just haven't warmed up yet. I mean, I just looked at the, the 10 day forecast. We've got some cool temperatures. I mean, I don't see any nighttime temperatures really above 60, except for maybe Saturday or Sunday night. Um, so, you know, we still got some time that we need to get those temperatures up. Um, if you're ever curious as what your soil temperature is, um, instead of taking a thermometer and sticking it in the soil, um, is to look at the bay temperature. You know, look at the Chesapeake Bay, look at the Hampton Roads Bay, see what the temperature is in the water. And we're usually about two to three degrees cooler than that. And I just checked yesterday and it's still 60 to 62 degrees in the bay. Um, and and when, when our temperatures are like that, that means our temperature in the soil is right around 60, maybe 59. Uh, you know, definitely Virginia Beach, you know, you, we're, we're over here, we're gonna be a little bit warmer, but up into Williamsburg, you could still be pretty cool. Um, so, you know, a large range of temperatures there in, in our soil, um, but that's probably the most important thing is you have time. So if you haven't done it, you're okay. If you have done it, I still think you're gonna be okay. Um, but I'll talk about mulching here in a second, which we'll get into that in a minute. But you really want to plant peppers when nighttime temperatures are consistently above 60. 
Um, and then the temperature range that te peppers grow best in is 70 to 90, which of course, you know, who wouldn't love to live in an area that never gets, you know, below 70 and never gets above 90. Um, unfortunately, we do range. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about how to control that when we do get hotter than 90. Um, and we'll talk about that. And we just talked about what you can do before that. Uh, and so that's just either being patient, waiting, don't plant yet. If you have planted, don't worry. If your peppers aren't growing, don't dump a bunch of fertilizer on it. That's not going to help. Um, you just kind of want to let them be there. Um, and then just kind of we'll, we'll talk about watering and mulching and all that here in a second. Um, so that's again, again, why we talk about raised beds, raised bed soil temperatures are probably a little bit warmer. If you're growing them in containers this year, um, which is a great op option for peppers, then, you know, you've got a little bit warmer temperature in your soil already, and you might see your peppers growing already. Um, you know, if you've been bringing them in, if you grow in containers, you can move them around. So you can bring them into the garage on cool nights. You can put them in a sunny location. When we get really hot, you might be able to bring them to a little bit of shady location, just in case uh, you're worried about, you know, not being able to be there to water them all the time. Uh, so a couple different things there, but growing in containers or growing in raised beds is a great option for peppers. Um, if you got them in the ground and they're not doing anything, don't worry. I think you're going to be fine. Um, okay, so let's talk about mulch. I, I love to mulch my vegetable garden. I do recommend doing it in stages. Um, so tomatoes, you can start to, to mulch a little bit earlier, squash, zucchini, those types of things. But peppers, wait on mulching those for a little bit longer. So mulch will keep your soil cool. It'll keep the moisture in, which is very important for peppers. Uh, we'll talk about watering a, a, a little bit later here. Um, but mulching, the benefit of it is it keeps moisture in. Um, it will keep your soil warmer when it's very cold. But right now, as it's warming up, it'll actually keep it a little bit cooler. And so what I recommend doing with peppers is not mulching them yet. Wait till we know the temperatures are warming up and the peppers begin to grow. Once you start to see those peppers starting to put a couple inches on, then you can go and mulch. And that'll help with the moisture and watering requirements. Um, and it'll help with, with, um, with uh, weeds and stuff like that. Pepper plants are very shallow rooted plants. So they don't have a very deep root system, which is why we're gonna talk about watering at length for, for um, in a minute. Um, but mulching will help that. Mulching will keep weeds away. And so with a shallow root system, with a shallow rooted plant, if you get a lot of weeds growing around your pepper plants and you need to go in there and pull weeds, you can damage the root system of your peppers. Um, and so I'm not gonna recommend that. So I love mulch. Mulch really, really helps. You can use lots of different things, pine straw, hardwood mulch, cypress, cedar. You really can use anything that you that you want. You can even use newspaper scraps. Um, some people use that black fabric, which does help heat up the soil. Um, lots of different options there, and we, we can help you with any of those if you need help with those. Um, but mulch does really help kind of keep the soil cooler when we start to warm up. So if we start to get into those 95, 100 degree days, which we know are gonna come in, in July and August, um, mulch is gonna help keep the soil cooler, which will keep them more in that temperature range. It also helps over the long haul, keep the soil temperature an even keel. So you don't get those sharp fluctuations. If we get you know two or three days in the 100 degrees, um, and then we drop back down to 80 degrees, it's gonna help kind of keep that temperature at an even base, which really helps prevent disease issues. Um, also mulch will help the splashing of dirt onto your vegetable plants. If you planted your vegetable garden, and we had that heavy downpour yesterday, you might see some mud on your leaves. Mulch will help that. Now, of course, I'm not gonna recommend uh, mulching pepper plants yet, probably not for another two or three or four weeks uh, with looking at the temperatures that we're having right now. Um, but mulch eventually will help keep the dirt off the leaves, which really helps with, with tomatoes, but does help with peppers as well. Helps keep the dirt off, which helps stop the spread of disease. Um, so mulching is very important. I just don't recommend doing it yet. So if you've already planted your peppers and you're planning on mulching, don't do it yet. If you already have mulched, maybe just go pull some of the mulch away from those pepper plants and just give them some time, give that soil some time to, to warm up. Again, temperature is very important with peppers. Um, and that's why I've talked about it a lot, sun and temperature. Uh, all right, so now staking your peppers. This is one of the easiest things because actually peppers are pretty easy to stake. So, you know, what I usually do is just with my pepper plant, I'll just get one of these. I love these kind of these plastic coated metal poles. So they're really sturdy. Um, you know, you can use bamboo, you can use a hardwood stake, you can use a lot of different things, but these are very easy. I put it right next to my pepper plant right when I plant it so I don't damage the root system. Um, and then that way it's there. And then as the plant grows up, I can just tie it to it. And I love that stretchy tie stuff. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I, did, I showed this in my tomato video, but this is our stretch tie. This is the best stuff to use. I mean, it's a 150 foot roll, it's super, super easy to use. You just break it like that. And then it stretches with the plant. So you can use a twist tie, 
You can use, you know, you know, old fabric around the house. You can use lots of different things. Um, twist ties are metal, so they're not going to expand with the plant. Some fabrics will. Um, a lot of people use like old pantyhose. Um, there's lots of different options, um, but this will stretch with the plant. So that's why I love this stuff, and it's easy to tie. It doesn't show up. It's nice and green, so it's very easy to use. So I recommend a stake. You know, you just follow up the, the pepper plant, the main stem, and you just keep tying it off as it gets bigger and bigger. Tomato cages are an awesome option. I mean, I almost feel like tomato cages were designed for peppers, not tomatoes necessarily. Um, so a, a 44 inch, a 54 inch tomato cage is gonna contain your pepper, keep it upright, because peppers, as they start to set their fruit, are gonna get fairly heavy. You know, that, 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 the top of that plant can get pretty robust and get pretty big. And if, that, if you get high winds as we do here, um, you know, we just experienced them yesterday. When we get high winds, that plant can fall over and snap. And when that plant snaps, it's done. And so, um, so you don't want to do that. You, don't, you, don't, you want to avoid that. And a simple steak or a tomato cage is super, super easy. Tomato cages are very, very simple. You just pop it over it. The best advice I can give you with a tomato cage is put it on there early. It's very difficult to get a tomato cage over top of a full grown pepper uh, because you got to work it all through there. It just takes some time. But, um, but tomato cages are awesome for peppers. A simple steak is a very good way of doing it. There's a lot of different systems out there that you can use, but that's how I recommend staking uh, your peppers, tomato cage or simple steak. Um, and then pruning peppers. So you really don't have to prune peppers. That's the nice thing is they're pretty easy to just kind of let grow. Um, there are some people that will recommend, and, I, and I, I don't say that this is good advice or bad advice. I don't, it, it's up to you as to what you want to do. I mean, everybody probably has some, some tips or tricks or techniques um, that they've done in the past, as I mentioned in my tomato video, planting them deeper in the ground, that kind of thing. Um, you don't have to do that with peppers. You just plant them right level with the ground. But pruning, you really don't have to prune peppers. They typically are going to grow very easily by themselves. They don't get huge. Uh, you don't need to control the size of them. What some people might recommend is actually picking off that first set of flowers. So while they're young and they're putting on growth, they'll start to flower pretty early. And you will say, well, I don't want to pick off my fruit. And you don't have to. But some people recommend it. Because actually setting, taking those, those first couple flowers off will help the plant continue to grow and get some size on it before it goes into putting a lot of energy into producing the fruit rather than producing a more robust plant. Um, so a lot of people will say that, it, that they recommend taking off the first couple flowers um, as that plant starts to grow and starts to uh, get a little bit larger and starts to flower. Just take some of those off. It'll help the plant grow and mature a little bit more so that you get more fruit later on. Um, so that's just a, a, you know, a couple tips. Uh, my grandfather taught me that. Um, so I've always done it is, you know, just go in there, pick off those flowers, those early flowers. And it's a great way to kind of, um, to kind of help the plant continue to grow. All right. So other than that, you really don't have to prune. Um, I do recommend uh, as you're going to harvest um, to not pull peppers. Um, a lot of us will go in with our tomatoes and just kind of twist them and, you know, gently or we'll just go in and pick them with our fingers. Um, and that's fine for tomatoes. But with peppers, um, it's more on a stem. So, I mean, think of like a bell pepper. You know, it's got that stem on it. Um, and so you want to go in and use your pruners, you know, cut them off. You can use garden center scissors. You can use just a shear. You can use lots of different things to, to make a nice clean cut. But that will help uh, the, the plant um, from, or prevent the plant from breaking. So if you go in and you just take that pepper and just snap it off, then sometimes you can snap the whole branch off and then you just lost a lot of, of peppers, uh, the potential to make a lot of peppers. If it happens, it's okay, it'll come back. Um, if you happen to accidentally snap it or a wind or something falls on it and snaps it, prune it off, make a nice clean cut, um, and then it should regrow from that spot that you cut. Um, but I do recommend that for harvesting. Use your pruners to cut them off. It's much safer for the plant. Disinfect your pruners. I always recommend that, especially when talking about um, our ornamental plants and our edible plants. Um, use a little bit of rubbing alcohol or even mouthwash um, to, to just kind of disinfect your pruners. So after you make a cut, you can dip it in a solution or you can use a little spray bottle and just spray them down um, and then go make your next cut because that does kind of help the spread of disease. Now, if you're working on one plant, you can disinfect first, cut the plant, especially if the plant looks healthy, uh, and then disinfect before you go to the next plant. Um, kind of helps cut some time down a little bit. Um, but that's just a great kind of uh, technique that I definitely recommend is disinfecting your pruners. Uh, okay, so let's talk about insect and disease. The nice thing is peppers don't have a lot of them. Um, you know, they can get aphids, they can get a uh, white fly, they can get a couple insect issues, cutworms might be a big problem. Um, so of course, I'm always gonna recommend whenever I talk about insect or disease being preventative rather than curative. So it's always easier to prevent rather than be on the curing side. 
And triple action is one of my favorites. So I love this one because it's got a hose in spray and you just attach that to your hose, turn the dial and then you can spray. So if you're doing a large garden, then this is a great option because you can use this multiple times. You can use this every seven to 10 days. You can use it up to the day of harvest. So it's a very easy one. It's triple action because it's an insecticide, a miticide and a fungicide. So it does all three things, which is great. A little bit harder on the curing side. So if you got the issue, triple action is going to take a little bit more sprays to really kind of get you there. Uh, but if you're doing it on the preventative side, I definitely recommend this. A great solution. Um, it's got neem oil and, um, and pyrethrins, which is from chrysanthemum oil. So it's completely organic, completely safe. Um, but it's a very easy one to use. Comes in the hose end. And then, of course, it comes in our just ready, ready to use. So if you've got a, just a single plant that you're doing, this is a great one. I always say you should have a triple action laying around your house. Because if you don't know what the issue is and you don't have time to come in and see us and bring us a leaf and then let us identify exactly what you need, triple action will at least get you started. Um, at least get you, you know, most of the way there. If you've got an issue, you can, you can always feel comfortable and safe spraying it with triple action. It's a great product, easy to use, ready to use or hose end, or even we have lots of concentrates too. So if you like to mix your own, we've got concentrates. Um, if you're dealing with other insect issues like uh, aphids or mealybugs, uh, we've got our Spinosad soap. So this is a insecticidal soap, which is great. Insecticidal soaps are awesome, but this also has Spinosad in it, uh, or Spinosad as some might call it, kind of like tomato and tomato. Uh, but Spinosad is very easy to spray. It's great against cutworms. So if you've got cutworms issues, if you've had them in the past, um, then you might try that product. It works really, really well. Cutworms are going to crawl on the ground. So it's the larva stage of a moth. They're going to crawl on the ground and cut off the base of your plant. It's going to fall over. It's going to die. Um, it also can spread disease. So you want to control the cutworms. They are crawling on the ground. So you can also use this. Let me see if I can show you that. So bug, slug, and snail bait. These are natural guard by Fertilome, completely organic, organic, OMRI listed. This is basically iron phosphate. So it's going to kill slugs and snails and things as they crawl over it. But it's also got spinosad, spinosad. And when, uh, when a cutworm crawls across this, it'll kill them. Uh, some people will put collars on their pepper plants and that's okay. You can use like, you know, the leftover tube from a paper towel roll or from a, a, a toilet paper roll. Um, you can put that around there, just kind of protect it. You can, you know, cut the bottom off a solo cup and put your plant in that and just kind of use that as a collar to protect it. Some people do that. I use, you know, some Spinosad and, and, and also crop rotation. I'm gonna talk about that with fertilizing, but, um, but crop rotation will help if you've had disease or fungus issues. Copper soap, uh, I didn't bring copper soap, but copper soap is another good one if you're showing uh, bacterial leaf spot um, or early blights. Um, so copper soap can help you as well. Again, being curative, being preventative is always better than curative. If you have insect or disease issues, bring them into us, let us know. Um, if it's something serious, we're probably gonna recommend tearing out the plant and discarding of it, unfortunately. Um, a lot of diseases like tobacco mosaic virus, uh, there's a couple other ones out there that can get into peppers. If that happens, we're going to recommend just discarding the plant because there's no cure for that. Um, but uh, neem oil is another good option. So neem oil is a nice safe one, especially for your household plants. Uh, real easy to use. That's a suffocant. So it's going to uh, suffocate the insect or the fungus and kind of prevent it from breathing because even funguses need air to breathe. And if you can suffocate it, then you can help uh, cure it and prevent it. Um, so a couple different options there uh, for disease or insect issues. Um, and of course, crop rotation helps that, which leads me right into fertilization. So I always talk about crop rotation when we talk about vegetable planting, um, because it's very important. I mean, farmers developed it many, many, many centuries ago, uh, because it's important because different plants use different nutrients out of the soil or a disease gets into the soil that doesn't affect tomatoes, but does affect peppers, um, or vice versa or another crop. So always recommend kind of moving them around your garden. So always kind of, I like to draw my garden each year you know, just draw it, sketch it out. So I know where I planted everything. So next year when I go to plant it, I can say, oh yeah, this is where I did this last year. So now I need to move it over here. And then maybe even taking every fourth year off and just letting the soil kind of, uh, kind of uh, naturally kind of come back and, and stimulate. Uh, lots of different things you can do for that. We can help you with that. Humic acid is a great way to kind of revitalize soil. Um, mulching also helps. Tilling and compost, letting it sit there. You can do clover seed, which restores the nitrogen. Lots of different options. Um, that we can help you with um, if you're doing your crop rotation. Um, but fertilizing. So let's talk about fertilizing for a minute. Um, peppers don't need a ton of fertilizer. Um, that's one, one of the reasons they're very easy to grow. Uh, whereas tomatoes use a lot of energy to kind of produce that tomato. Peppers don't need as much. And really what we don't want you to do with, with your peppers is apply a lot of nitrogen. 
So anything that's going to be above kind of like a, a 10, you know, the generic 10, 10, 10 ratio, uh, which we carry. And if you need that, we can get it for you. Um, but I love just simple garden tone. And garden tone is made by a Soma. It's completely organic, completely safe. And it is a 344. Four. So a little bit higher in the phosphorus and potassium, not as much nitrogen, which is good. You know, you know, peppers are going to put on green leaves and the more and more nitrogen that you put in there, the more and more green leaves you're going to get. Um, so having a little bit of phosphorus in there will help set fruit. Um, this also has calcium in it, which will help with the blossom end rot. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but garden tone is a very simple one. It's great for all vegetable plants, even when you get into like the fall crop, when you're doing spinaches and lettuces and stuff like that. Um, garden tone is a great one to have around. So if you're doing a garden, this is great. It comes in a four pound, eight pound and 18 pound size. So um, really, really good, simple formula, um, basic, you know, organic fertilizer. You know, you can be safe. You know, if you, you know, accidentally put you know, three cups on a plant instead of one cup, um, you're not going to kill the plant. Um, so, but peppers don't need as much fertilizer. Um, still going to recommend in raised beds or in pots to put it on a little bit more frequently than you would in the ground. So with a lighter fertilizer like Garden Tone, you, you're still going to do it just the same as, as, your, as your tomatoes. In the ground, you're going to do every four to six weeks typically. In a pot, you're going to do it every three to four weeks uh, because you got drainage holes, raised beds every three to four weeks. Maybe you can go to five weeks. Um, but uh, easy kind of just to remember every month, I got to get out there and fertilize. Um, it's a great way of kind of being uh, uh, on top of it. And that's kind of a great thing to kind of recommend um, doing anyways, is just going out and inspecting your garden weekly. You know, go out there and enjoy the, the day. Um, on a nice day, just go out there, wander around through your garden, your vegetables, check them out, look for insects, look for, look for disease issues, and then say, okay, well, do I need to fertilize? Do the plants look like they need fertilizer? When did I fertilize? You can program it into your smartphone so it just tells you, hey, I fertilized on May 1st, so I need to fertilize on June 1st and July 1st and August 1st. Um, it kind of helps you keep that pace. Um, but containers, raised beds, going to drain faster. Nutrients are going to work down through the soil a little bit quicker. Um, so you're going to have to fertilize a little bit more in the ground. You can, you can stage that off to about every four to six weeks. Don't use a high nitrogen. Now let's talk about blossom end rot for a second. I brought this calcium nitrate so you can see. I'm not going to necessarily recommend this one for peppers all the time because if you look at that number right there, 15.5, that's pretty high in nitrogen. Um, but I wanted to bring it so you could see the picture. As you can see, tomatoes, if you've ever grown tomatoes, you might have experienced this problem. It's called blossom and rot. Um, it's actually a fungus uh, that, a, that, that will get into a plant that is calcium deficient. So um, it's a calcium deficiency and calcium will help correct that. Um, while I might not recommend that for peppers, which it's not a bad one for peppers, it's just a little high in nitrogen for me, um, then I would definitely recommend Magical. Magical is awesome. You probably are going to hear me talk about this a lot if you ever tune in for my lawn classes. Magical is an awesome product. It changes your pH, so it's going to bring your pH up, um, which we'll talk about pH in just a second. Uh, that'll be my next topic after we finish up with fertilizing. But it'll change your pH a little bit, but it's got a lot of calcium. So it's a lime-based product that's derived from calcium, and so it's going to give you a lot of calcium. I put this in my vegetable garden every spring season before I go plant. It just really, really helps add a lot of calcium, and you don't have a lot of those blossom end rot issues because tomatoes can get them, but peppers can too. So if you've ever grown peppers and you've had an issue with that blossom end rot, that black spot usually on the bottom of the fruit can appear on different portions of the fruit, but calcium is going to help with that. And Magical is a great solution for that. This does a thousand square feet. So it's a great little bag that you can put in your vegetable garden before the start of the season. If you missed it and you still need to do it, it's not too late. You can put it in there. As you know, your peppers aren't probably doing much. Tomatoes haven't done a whole lot either. Um, so it's a great time to get this in the soil if you haven't. If you want to do lime to change your pH, this, this works right into um, our pH. Um, if uh, pH for peppers is usually somewhere between 5.5 to 6.5, maybe even to 7 would be okay. Um, but 5.5 to 6.5 is kind of a general for most peppers. If you want to get specific, you can look those up for sure. Um, but I, you know, typically in that 5.5 to 6.5 range is what our soil is kind of in. Usually we're in the 5.5, maybe a little bit lower. Uh, we're usually a little bit more acidic than that. Um, so using Magic Hell will help bring up your pH. You can also do lime. So just using a, a dolomitic garden lime takes longer to change your pH. So if you want to do a pH test, we do them for free here at the garden center at our Independence and Great Neck location. We can usually do them right on the spot for you. If we're available to do that, we will. Um, if not, you can leave us your name and number and the soil sample and we'll give you a call. Um, but we can do soil samples for free for our Garden Rewards customers. 
gives you a quick, simple uh, knowing of, of what your pH is. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, you know, dialed in to, to getting pretty specific for you. And then we can tell you what to recommend. Dolomitic Lime is going to take six months to change your pH. Magical will do it in a month. Um, and Magical has calcium. So that's why I tend to use it. I like it. Magical won't last as long. So your pH isn't going to hold for as long as it will with the Dolomitic Lime. That'll change your pH for a much longer period. So, you know, Dolomitic Lime, you might get one to two years out of it. Magical, you might get five to six months. Um, but Magical is a great product. It has lots of calcium, which is why I love it. Um, so it's a great one. Now, one more thing that I'll throw in there just for people that might not know this product, it's called Biotone Starter. I recommend this for every plant that you haven't planted yet. If you've already planted, you missed it. <laughs> but if you if you haven't planted yet, get some Biotone Starter. It's a great starter fertilizer. It's a 433, so it's not high in nitrogen, but it's got beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizae, which are awesome. They attach themselves to the roots. They form a symbiotic relationship and it lasts for the entire season. Um, and on, on ornamental plants that you're planting for the life, you know, shrubs, perennials that you're planting to come back, it can stay with the plant for its entire life cycle. Um, so these are great things uh, that, that we've, that we've uh, 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 kind of uh, de developed or understood a little bit better as we got into the organic uh, uh, space. Uh, mycorrhiza and beneficial bacteria, they're in the soil. This just adds more of them and it gets them going and it gets it right to the root system. So if you haven't planted yet, and pick up some biotone started with all your vegetable plants, any kind of plant that you plant, annuals, perennials, trees and shrubs, but definitely for vegetable plants, it's a great way to get, get them started and get them running. Um, so that's a great option right there. So think about biotone starter. Um, okay, so next would be watering. Uh, let's talk about watering for just a minute. Watering uh, for peppers is pretty important. They want about an inch of water a week. A uh, great way of kind of knowing that is I got a couple of different things you can use. Of course, uh, rain gauge. Rain gauge is an easy way of knowing how much rain you got. So how much rain did we get yesterday? Well, you can look it up. Um, you can get pretty close on, on the internet to find out how much rain you got. But a rain gauge tells you right there what how much you got. It'll measure it by inches. And so if you know you got some rain, but you didn't know how much, well, I got a half an inch. So maybe by the end of the week, you might need to water a little bit more. Um, difficult to kind of know how much an inch of water is, but typically a gallon of water on a plant is going to be about an inch of water. Um, you know, don't pour it on all at once because it's going to run off. Um, but that does kind of help. Also, you've got a great tool right there on your hand. Your finger is a great way of testing the moisture. So going down to your second knuckle, see if the soil is, is still moist. Um, and then that means you're still good. Um, you want a well-drained soil. As I talked about, amending your soil, making sure that it's well-drained. That's super important for peppers that they get well-drained. They can experience root rot which happens when the soil stays wet too long. Um, so make sure you've got good improved drainage, good, good drainage on your pepper plants. Um, they, can, they can take it fairly dry, but in the hotter temperatures, they're gonna want more moisture, which is why I talked about mulch. There's also a moisture meter. So this is a great little tool that you can have laying around. Um, this does soil, light, and pH. So it'll do your moisture, it'll do light and pH. So this is a great thing. Definitely recommend this for house plants. You know, because a lot of people are curious of when to, when, when to water your houseplants. Uh, but great for the garden, too. It'll kind of get you pretty close on your light, get you pretty close on your pH, and definitely tell you your moisture level um, and if you need to, to apply more moisture. Um, so about a gallon of water per plant um, is typically an inch of water. Um, and uh, deep watering less often is more important. So when we get into those hotter temperatures and you've got your peppers hopefully mulched, um, a nice gallon of water, you know, using your watering can, or even just going out there with your hose and using your watering wand, or again, don't spray the leaves. I always recommend that. Don't water your leaves. Watering your leaves can spread fungus and disease. Um, dampness, darkness cause disease. So always water in the morning if you can. The plants need the moisture throughout the entire day. Water a gallon of water if you can, um, and just kind of and just kind of gauge it and use your finger. It's a great way to test. I know it sounds weird, but just stick your finger down on the soil. If it's moist, it's fine. If it's wilting, wilting is not always a sign that you need to water. I talk about this when I talk about tomatoes all the time. Wilting does not necessarily mean that it needs more water. If you if your plant is wilting and your soil is moist, don't water it. Let it dry out. It's got too much water and you might be verging on the side of, of, of getting root rot. Plants will wilt and look like they need water when they have root rot. Now, even in extreme temperature heat, so if we, if we get into the 9,500 degree days um, and your plant is wilting but your soil is moist, don't water it. That doesn't mean it needs water. It's protecting itself. So plants wilt for lots of different reasons. Uh, it's not always that they need water. 
So keep that in mind when, when talking about watering. Uh, but peppers do need adequate watering throughout the season. Mulching will extremely help keep that moisture around the root system and, and, and eliminate as much watering that needs that you'll have to give it. Um, so that's water. Okay, so now we've kind of gone through everything. We've talked about a, a couple different things. I'll, I'll do a quick recap at the end, but I do want to go through some of the, the pepper plants that we carry, and then I'll answer all your questions. Um, but we'll start, I'm going to break them up into two different things. So we've got two different types of peppers. We've got sweet peppers and hot peppers. Um, I think most of us probably know that. Uh, you've got your sweet peppers, you know, bells, I'll talk about all those. And then you got your hot peppers, which there's a huge assortment in. And I think a lot of us, I think a lot of us think peppers are spicy. And so that's why there's so many different types of spicy peppers. Um, so you got lots of different things from, you know, your bells, which are, you know, your round kind of, you know, squarish. Uh, uh, fruits, and then you got your longer banana peppers. I'll start to show you some of these here, and then you got a ton of assortment in your spicy peppers. Um, so I'm going to show you some of our favorites. Of course, most of them are Chef Jeff. I think all of them except one are Chef Jeff. Chef Jeff is an amazing one. Is an amazing company um, because they they have a great tag. They have a great uh, plant. Um, they, they have a huge selection of different types of vegetables. And it's just got some great information on the label. So if you're ever looking at our vegetable plants, like the first one we're going to start with is Better Bell. Um, so it's got some great information on the back. It's going to tell you what kind of sunlight it needs. Obviously, full sun. How far to plant them apart. It's going to tell you the days to maturity. So this one's 65 days. And then it's going to tell you some other information about, you know, how big the fruit might get, different types of things. So if you can't find one of us to help you, because, um, you know, we're, we can't, you know, help every single customer. We try. But if you need to talk to us, we're here. So, you know, trust me, we'll, we'll get to you. Um, but it, you can find a lot of good information right here on the back of the tag. So it's a great resource for you. But this is Better Bell, probably one of my favorite green bell peppers. So we're going to start with the sweet ones. I've got them grouped off into bells. So this is your just your Better Bell. It's a very good producer. Of, of green bell peppers, uh, very easy to grow. It's not a huge plant, um, so it's a nice, simple, easy bell pepper. Um, this one will actually mature to a red if you let it get that far to ripening. And I'm gonna talk about that at the end when we cut, or I'll kind of talk about it as we kind of go through them. But peppers take a long time usually to get to maturity, somewhere between 70 to 80, 90 days, some even 100 days. Um, so be patient with your peppers. Um, you can pick all your bell peppers while they're green and they'll taste like a green bell pepper. Um, but if you let them mature and get to that red color or orange or yellow, as I'll show you, um, or even purple, um, they, they will get a little bit sweeter. Um, the, the vitamin level will get a little bit higher. But don't be afraid. If you need a pepper and you're making a dish and you need a pepper and you're like, I got all these green peppers, I'm waiting to turn red, go pick a green pepper and use it. Uh, they're very sweet. They're very good. They're very nutritional. Um, but if you're waiting to get those red peppers, it does take a little bit of time. So just be patient with it. But Better Bell is a very, very good choice, especially for beginners. It's the one I would recommend. Big Bertha is another good green bell pepper. Um, it's a really, really big pepper. So I think these get somewhere between seven inches. So, so six to seven inches long by about four inches wide. You know, those four kind of lobes on the inside. Uh, great pepper, really big one. It's, it's also going to uh, produce a lot of peppers. Um, so another really good one, Chef Jeff, this is the premium. So if you're looking at the label, the premium varieties are a little bit, you know, the, the, the nicer varieties, the ones that have been around a little bit longer, but proven to work very well. Um, so Better Bell, or uh, 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 this is the, sorry, the Big Bertha pepper. Uh, so another good variety uh, of just your green bell pepper. So then we'll get into some colors. You got your golden bell. So, you know, another bell pepper, easy to grow. Um, turns this gold color. So instead of turning red as the most of your green bell peppers are going to turn red, this one's going to turn yellow. So if you let it ripen and you want that yellow pepper, um, it's going to turn, turn, turn to the yellow, col yellow color if you let it mature. If it's green and you want to use it, use it. It's still fine. You don't have to wait for it to turn yellow. So if you need a pepper, use it. This is a good one, yellow. Um, a lot of people wonder why green and orange and red peppers are so expensive in the supermarket. That's because it takes a long time for them to mature and get to that point. They need a lot of sun and they need to get uh, to that maturity level. This is Valencia orange. So this is your orange bell pepper. So again, same thing, easy to grow. Bell peppers are very easy. You can get lots of different sizes typically on one plant, but most of them are gonna get it four to five inches um, long and about three to four inches wide. Uh, but this is Valencia orange. It'll turn orange as it matures. Uh, very sweet. And then orange blaze. So I brought this one just because, as you can see here, you got that AAS mark. That's an all-American uh, selection, and that means it's been proven to do very, very well. Um, it has a lot of production. Uh, it's a very good quality. has a lot more disease 
insect resistance. Um, so you're going to find that AAS mark on some of these. That means it's been proven to do very well. And so it's just kind of an easy one for beginners maybe. Um, or if, you've, if you haven't been successful with peppers in the past and you're trying again, you might go for some of those AAS winners. Um, that means that they're All-American Selection Awesome Pepper Orange Blaze. So this one's a sweet bell pepper. It's going to go to that orange, similar to the Valencia orange. It's going to go orange. It can also be eaten as it's green. Um, so we've got, those are our bell peppers. And then the last one, of course, it's not my chef, Jeff. This is my one, not chef, Jeff one. doesn't mean that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, you know, grown from a different grower. Uh, but this one is a purple beauty. So I kind of wanted to show you at least the tag. So, so you can see, you can get lots of different colors in bells. I mean, they even make some that are chocolatey in color now, um, that kind of brownish color. So you got purple, yellow, red, orange, and green, all great. Obviously, the color, the, when they turn to that rich color, that red, yellow, orange color, they're going to become sweeter. They're going to get a little bit more vitamin rich, but they do take more time. So if you want peppers and you want to get them, just go out there, eat them while they're green, save some to let go to maturity. Um, as they start to change colors, some people have had been successful with as you begin to see that change, you can cut them and put them in a brown paper bag and they should ripen up a little bit for you in a windowsill. Uh, but typically, I'm going to recommend just leaving it on the plant, let it get to full maturity. When it turns to that bright red color, that bright orange color, then you can go out there and pick them off and, and eat them and they're going to be much sweeter. Uh, okay, so, oh, and then I forgot my red pepper. So there's red beauty. So again, another bell pepper. So we got a lot of bell peppers right there. You got oranges, yellows, reds purples, and just your regular basic green. So you got lots of different options. So now we're gonna get into our longer kind of banana style sweet pepper. So this is sweet banana supreme. So these are gonna be longer fruits. They're gonna get somewhere between seven to eight inches long by about two inches wide. Um, usually these plants are gonna get a little bit taller. So somewhere around the five to six foot range maybe, um, depending on, on, on the availability of sun. Um, but they're, they're pretty easy to grow. And the thing that I love about banana peppers and banana peppers, aren't going to taste like a banana. They're going to taste like a sweet pepper. They just look like a banana. This one happens to be yellow. Um, so they're a lot, they're more prolific. They produce a lot of them and they produce much quicker. And so you can kind of keep picking and keep picking and keep picking. And that's why I love banana peppers. They mature a little bit quicker. So somewhere between 60 and 75 days, uh, you'll get, you'll get mature. And that way you can go and start picking. So you can start picking a little bit earlier, about two or three months after we warm up and they start to grow. Um, so super banana supreme is a great one. Um, I've also got Carmen, which is a, one of our favorites. Again, you're going to see that AAS winner. It's an all-American selection. Um, so it's a great pepper, Carmen pepper. Um, you know, you can pick. They're going to be green. If you let them stay on, uh, on the vine a little bit or stay on the plant a little bit longer, they're going to turn to that kind of maroonish red color, which is really pretty that you can see there. Um, but really easy one to grow. Um, very similar to just a regular banana pepper, but it's sweet. It's easy to grow. You're going to get a lot of them. So this is that premium. Um, uh, Chef Jeff, and it's an AAS winner. Um, so really, really good one. Try that one. It's really easy for beginners. Uh, probably one of the first peppers that I actually grew. Uh, really, really easy one to grow. And then, of course, pepper, pepperoncini, which is kind of like your uh, Italian pepper. Um, you know, a lot of people use these for pickling, kind of making that sweet banana pepper. Um, you can throw them on pizzas. You can eat them fresh. A lot of people don't know that. But a lot of pickling plants, like pickling cucumbers, you can actually eat those fresh. Um, so they're very good fresh. Um, this one gets about three to five inches long. You know, you're typically going to use these in Italian dishes. Um, a lot of people use them for pickling. Um, so there's another option. Again, prolific bearer because it's that kind of longer, skinnier uh, 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 pepper. So then we're going to talk about some here that are going to start to get a little bit spicier. I mean, barely. So they, they don't even, we're going to talk about the Scoville units as we start to get into the, the hot ones. But these barely even show up on the Scovilles. Uh, but this is mariachi. Uh, mariachi is a sweet pepper that gives you a little bit more spice. Um, so if it were on the Scoville units, it would be probably somewhere around the three to 500 mark. Um, but it's a very easy pepper, smaller peppers, somewhere between, I think, I think it's about two inch pepper, two to three inch pepper. Um, so you're going to get a lot of them and they're just sweet, great snacking kind of pepper. I've got a little group of snackings that I'm going to show you here as well. Uh, but mariachi is a good one. And again, that AAS winner. So you see that AAS mark means it's a very good one. Try it. It's an awesome pepper. Uh, and these are going to be green, and then they're going to turn red as they mature. Then we've got the Cubanel Biscayan. Um, so this is another one. It's going to it's going to add a little bit more spice. It's going to start to get just a little bit spicier. Um, not really showing up on the Scoville uh, uh, list again, um, but a nice sweet pepper, kind of in that banana style. 
Uh, so again, a slightly longer pepper, very easy one to grow. So this is kind of a cool one, lime green, and then turning to that bright red. Uh, again, you can eat them at any point. Um, so really cool one there. So here's a couple snacking ones. This is called sweetie pie. So again, that AAS mark, love that AAS mark means it's been proven to work. Um, so sweeties are gonna be somewhere between one to two inches. So kind of a small little pepper, gets lots of them, smaller plant, the plant doesn't get quite as big. So great for containers. You can even grow these in hanging baskets. Um, so this is a great option, sweetie pie. And then I brought this one just to kind of show you. So it's a little bit bigger. So you can see, you can actually get them actually a bigger size. So this is a yummy snacking pepper. So this is a tabletop. This can grow in this pot for the entire season. You can actually start, you can see right in there, they're starting to grow a little pepper in there and they're flowering already. So this is a great option if you just want to, if you've got a balcony, you know, small space, I don't have a yard, but I want to grow peppers. Here's a great option. You can buy this in this pot. It's got this little cage built into it. It's nice and sturdy. You can grow this in there for a long time um, or you can just buy a smaller snacking pepper and plant it in your own pot and put a small little tomato cage in it. Um, so great option there for you. But those are some snacking peppers. They've become real popular, especially with kids. So if you got kids um, and you wanna grow some peppers for them, those are great because they can go cut them right off the plant and eat them right there. Super, super easy to grow. Now we got Cajun Bell. So Cajun Bell is gonna start to spice up a little bit. This is kind of a bell style pepper. So it gets somewhere between two to three inches um, and it's gonna be like two to four lobes. So great for stuffing. Um, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to give you a little bit more spice. It's going to start to heat up a little bit on you. Um, again, not showing up really on the Scoville, uh, uh, list, um, but a very good one and gives you a little bit more spice, hence the name Cajun Bell. And again, an AAS winner, awesome, cool, new variety, um, Cajun Bell. So you can try that one out. Italian Roaster, we're going to keep this in the sweet family, even though it'll add a little bit more spice as well. Um, some people say it's kind of similar to maybe like a Poblano. Uh, Pablano will be next as we start to get up the, the, the scale there. Um, but this is a very good one. Um, it's a Italian roaster, so it's great for grilling, um, great for stuffing. They get long peppers, so they're somewhere between eight to nine inches long. Um, so a nice long pepper, uh, really, really cool variety. Again, starting off green and then gets sweeter and a little bit more spice as it turns to that red color. Um, so that really, you know, this is that great where we start to get, talk a lot about the great mixture of sweet and spice together. Um, so Italian roaster, kind of a cool variety. So then next is going to be my Pablano. So Pablano, you probably know Pablano is, um, it's, it's probably somewhere around the three to 500 mark. So we'll talk about the Scoville measurement. Um, so when, when we talk about peppers and how spicy they are, you're going to hear the word Scoville. That was Wilbur Sculver in 1912. Give you a little history, a scientist who was able to, to, to start to kind of rate the spiciness of peppers. It was somewhat subjective. Uh, we've gotten a little bit more scientific with it these days, um, but it's still considered a Scoville unit. Um, and so we'll talk about those numbers as we continue to go. Uh, but this is a good one, Pablano. It's great for salsas, great for if you just don't, if you don't like a lot of heat, but you want a little, little bit of spice, this is a very, very good one. Pablanos are easy to grow. They get about two to three inches long. So a nice kind of normal size pepper, uh, very easy one, Pablano. So there's a good one. Um, and then this is kind of a cool, unique one that you probably haven't heard of. It's called a shishito pepper. This is Takara shishito. So the cool thing about this one is it's really a sweet pepper, but then you can get a spicy one every once in a while. And so it's kind of funny how this one works. I mean, some people will say one out of 10 is going to be spicy. So it's kind of like a fun game where you go to, you know, eat your sweet peppers and then all of a sudden you get a spicy one. So it's kind of fun. It also will typically get spicy in a drier condition or a more well-drained soil or more heat. You'll get a little bit more heat in the pepper. So it's kind of a fun one to grow um, because it, it adds a little bit of spice to the end of it, but it's a sweet pepper with a little bit of spice. Um, so really kind of cool one, Takara Shishito. So it's a Japanese uh, variety of pepper. All right, so now we're gonna get into our hot peppers. So again, uh, uh, sweet peppers are very easy to grow. Um, you know, nice and sweet. Most of them are going to take a little bit more time to get to that red color um, or, or orange color or yellow color, whatever color it is that you might be uh, trying to attain. But they're all perfectly fine to eat while they're green. They'll still be sweet. They'll still be yummy and they're still nutritious. Um, so definitely pick them and eat them and then save some on there. Um, and then now we'll talk about hot peppers. So hot peppers um, actually typically take a little bit longer to get there. Um, and we're gonna go all the way up the Scoville range um, to, to kind of get to the hottest peppers. Um, but we'll start off with Rico, Ajay Rico. 
So this is kind of a new one. Again, AAS winner. Uh, lots of people have been super excited about this one. I've never grown this one. I'm growing this one for the first time this year. Um, I'm really excited about this. Um, this one is 1,000 to 5,000 units on the Scoville range. Um, but it's supposed to be really, really sweet. So very similar to like a jalapeno, but a little less spicy. So if you think jalapenos are too spicy for you, but you still like a little bit of spice, this might be a good option. Um, kind of similar to an Anaheim, if you've ever grown an Anaheim. Uh, we don't carry that one as much anymore. But a Jai Rico, very, very good uh, variety um, and not, not very, you know, lots of sweetness with a little bit of spice. So that one to 5,000 range, uh, you know, you're going to get the 1,000 in the green. And then as you let it get riper, it's going to get hotter. And it, so if you get to that red color, you're going to get to about to that 5,000 units on the Scoville range. Um, so a Jai Rico, really cool one. All right, then we've got Garden Salsa, which is going to be similar to like uh, uh, more of the jalapeno uh, style or on the on the Scoville range. So this one gets to about 3,000 units on the Scoville range. So this is called gar Garden Salsa. Again, kind of a lot of people think jalapenos, think salsa. Um, so they just called this one Garden Salsa, a very easy one to grow. Again, spicy peppers are going to be smaller. They're going to be more prolific. You're going to get a lot more of them. They do take a little bit longer for maturity. So somewhere between 70 to 90 days on this one. Um, so this is a great one, Garden Salsa, kind of a different variety. All right, now we're going to get into, of course, our jalapeno. Jalapenos are one of the most popular uh, spicy ones. So this one is four to five thousand dollars, or four to five thousand uh, 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 units on the Scoville range. Um, so nice spice, good sweetness. You probably know jalapeno, so I don't have to talk about it too too long. But jalapenos are great, easy peppers. Use them in a lot of Mexican dishes and a lot of salsas and different things. Um, great for even stir fries um, as well. So jalapeno, really, really good one. Um, again, that green pepper, and then as you let it get red, it'll get more spicy. Um, so then we're going to go to the Hungarian hot wax. So this goes, let's see, I'll make sure I'm not going off my list here. Um, so this goes five to 10,000 on the Scoville range. Um, so it's going to get a little bit spicier. We're starting to get a little bit hotter. This one's the yellow color. So Hungarian hot wax. Um, so really, really good pepper. Still gets you that sweetness. But it's going to give you some spice as well. I'm starting to get a little bit spicier. This one doesn't take quite as long to mature either. So this is somewhere in that 65 to 75 day range. Um, so it takes a little bit less time to get to mature, maturity. Yellows typically take, you know, they're going to come out that kind of light green and then go to yellow. Um, so a really, really popular variety, Hungarian hot wax. All right. Now you probably, uh, you know, the sriracha craze. Here's our sriracha pepper. Um, so this one's going to be somewhere in that, that same 70 to 80 degree, uh, 80 day range. Um, it's going to be in the, um, let's see if I can't remember quite. I think this is in the, uh, 8,000 units. So this is starting to get a little bit spicier, 8,000 units on the Scoville range. Great for, as you can see, wok stars as they've labeled it. So great in your Chinese dishes, uh, uh, in your stir fries to kind of add a little bit of spice. Um, great for, um, uh, uh, fajitas, really, really good one. Um, so sriracha, um, a lot of people use sriracha sauce these days. Uh, Serrano, Serrano, most people probably know. So Serrano is, I think in the 10,000. So we're starting to get a little bit spicier. So yeah, 10,000 to 23,000, um, on the Scoville range. So Serrano pepper, uh, a little bit shorter, a little bit more nub nose. So a little bit, uh, not, not quite as pointy at the bottom, uh, but a very, very good one. Very prolific. Serrano pepper, a lot of people use it, great in sauces, adds a little bit more spice. So we're starting to heat it up, starting to keep getting hotter and hotter. All right, so now we'll go to cayenne. So cayenne, of course, probably most of us know the cayenne pepper. Uh, so a great way to spice. These are longer uh, uh, fruits, so they're gonna get somewhere between that six to seven inch range. Uh, longer fruits, the cayenne pepper. Uh, a lot of people at the end of the season when they've all turned red will take the plant and just cut it off of the ground and hang them upside down and dry them. Uh, so that's a great way of drying these is right there on the plant. You just kind of cut it off and hang them, let them dry right there on the plant. But cayenne pepper, a lot of us know that one. This is in that uh, 30 to 50,000 Scoville range. Then we've got our super chili. So super chili peppers, again, kind of one of that salsa-rific uh, uh, plants for, from Chef Jeff. Uh, this one is going to be, I think this is in the 30 to 40, uh, 30 to 40, yeah, 40 to 50,000 Scovilles. So this is starting to get a little bit spicier than your cayenne, but a really good one. Um, again, about that six to seven inch long pepper. Um, so this is uh, super chili. And then we're going to go to our Thai dragon. Now we're starting to really heat up. This is 50 to 100,000 on the Scovilles. So starting to get even hotter. Thai dragon, 
Again, long kind of chi uh, Japanese variety uh, pepper. Um, really, really good in stir fries. Uh, very, very spicy. Starting to really heat up now. Um, and this one's a very prolific one. Um, the plant only gets about two to three feet tall, so it's not a huge plant. Great, again, for containers. Uh, so this is a very good variety. Thai dragon. All right, now we're going to start to get real spicy. So if, if I had them, we are currently out. Habanero. Habanero's up there in that 100,000 to 150,000 on the Scoville range. A lot of us knew habanero is one of the spiciest ones. So that's probably where most people are starting to peak out on their spiciness range is habanero peppers. It's the orange kind of blunt nose, smaller pepper, uh, very easy to grow. Uh, we will get them again, uh, but habaneros we're currently today out of, uh, but hopefully next week we can get some more habaneros in. But habaneros are very popular, uh, starting to really heat up at that point. Um, and then we're going to start to get into a little bit of that, that, that scarier range. So now we're in the Caribbean hot red, 400,000 units. So this is really starting to get spicy. This plant doesn't get huge. It's a nice bushy plant. You can kind of see it right there, two to three feet tall. Um, your peppers are typically going to be about an inch to an inch and a half. So a little bit smaller, kind of like your habanera, um, but Caribbean, Caribbean hot red. So 400,000 units. Then we're gonna go to Jamaican yelling yellow. So look at that spicy guy. So this is gonna be a yellow spicy tomato, 400 to 500,000 uh, units on the Scoville range. So this one's really, really starting to get hot. Uh, really good one though. Uh, people love this one. It's, it's a variety that you may not have heard of before, but Jamaican yelling yellow. So again, uh, a smaller pepper, about two and a half inches, uh, two to two and a half inches long. Uh, really, really great variety. Uh, Jamaican yelling yellow. And then Extreme Inferno, now we're getting into the millions. So this is 1.3 million. Um, so this is really, really getting hot. Uh, we don't have the ghost pepper currently. This is about the same range as the ghost pepper is one to 1.3 million uh, on the Scoville. This one is Extreme Inferno. So it's what we're carrying right now because we don't have the ghost in yet. Uh, we will get the ghost pepper. So if you're looking for ghost pepper specifically, similar range as the Extreme Inferno. So now we're talking really, really spicy. Get your milk ready. Have your milk ready for this one. Um, and then we're going to start to get into, of course, the two hottest ones. Uh, so we're going to go first with our Trinidad Scorpion. So Trinidad Scorpion pepper. Now these are where you got to start being careful, even touching the leaves. So if you touch these leaves, wipe your brow when it's hot. It's going to really burn your forehead. Don't rub your eyes. Don't put them in your mouth. Super, super, I mean, the, the, just the leaves have the oil on it uh, that can really get spicy. So be careful handling these plants. Um, but Trinidad, uh, scorpion pepper, 2 million on the Scoville range. So now we're starting to get into, I mean, literally pepper spray. So pepper spray is between 2 and 5 million on the Scoville range. This is really getting spicy. So if you're trying to dare yourself or dare your friends or, or you just love really spicy food, this is a great one, Trinidad scorpion. And then we'll finish off the least list with the hottest pepper known to man right now that I know of, at least, or the at least as you can grow, um, is the Carolina Reaper. So Carolina Reaper, there it is, 2.2 million on the Scoville units. So now we're really talking hot. Um, about uh, a, a, a nice, easy plant to actually grow. It gets about three to four feet high, um, you know, easy uh, pepper to grow. Um, but the Carolina Reaper is very, very spicy. Same thing. Be careful touching the leaves. Be careful touch it, handling the plant and rubbing your eyes, wear your gloves, wash your hands when you're done touching it. Um, but a really, really spicy, you want to you wanna go as spicy as you possibly can, the Carolina Reaper is the one. Um, so again, I, as you can see, we've got the whole gamut on the Scoville range uh, of peppers. We've got lots of sweet peppers. Um, and every day we're probably getting in more varieties. Um, peppers are so much fun. Um, I hope you've learned something here. Uh, we talked a lot about sun. Give them as much sun as you possibly can, six to eight hours. Don't feed them too much nitrogen. They don't need as much nitrogen. Um, they don't have as many disease and insect issues. You don't have to worry about pruning them as much. You don't have to stake them as much. Mulch them when the soil temperatures warm up. If you've already planted and they haven't done anything, you're in the same boat as most of us. Um, it's not your fault. It's the soil temperature hasn't warmed up. So give it some time, they'll start to grow um, and, and, and you'll be very successful this year. Um, if you've got any issues, of course, you can always contact us, send us pictures through Facebook, come in and see us, bring a little clipping of the plant if you have an issue, give them sun, 
Don't fertilize them with too much nitrogen. Watch the calcium so you don't get the blossom in rot. Inspect your garden. Plan accordingly. Have fun with them. They're so easy to grow. I hope you learned something here. Um, and of course, ask us any question uh, that you might have. I'm going to go through the questions now and answer all your questions um, as much as I possibly can. Um, and then we'll see you next time. Next, we'll, next week, we'll be talking about lawns and uh, we'll be talking about how to care for your house plants. And then we'll continue to do these throughout the entire year as much as we possibly can. And as long as we need to, we're here for you. And thanks for attending. And I'm going to go through and answer your questions now. All right, let's go back up to the beginning here. Are there herbs? So Ryan asks, are there herbs or veggies that should not be planted next to peppers? Not necessarily. Now, if I'm dealing with some of those really, really spicy ones, just because if, I, if I'm in there working and I'm not thinking, okay, I'm in there weeding, you know, I usually do, if, if you're going to do some very, very hot, spicy ones, keep them somewhat separate just so you're not rubbing them. But uh, there's no issues typically with um, um, any kind of issues with, with not being um, companion plants, uh, not growing well together. You don't have any issues there with uh, herbs or veggies growing together. I think the, the probably the most commonly grown vegetable in this area that people need to be concerned about growing two different varieties is corn. They can cross pollinate. Uh, there is a list of lots of different companion plants out there. A lot of people plant marigolds to keep insects out. Other people will plant lantanas and different types of, of blooming plants to attract pollinators in. You do need the pollinators, uh, but typically, no, you're not going to have any issues planting different types of peppers or herbs together. Um, so Betsy says, anyone else is screen freezing? I hope you ex didn't experience that the whole time. Um, if it ever stops raining, then I will get the garden ready. Um, yeah, I know we've had a lot of rain, but don't worry, you've got time. So Tom, you know, you got some time. Don't worry too much. You, you, we, we still are warming up. Our temperatures are still cool. We still have plenty of time. We'll be here. We'll, we'll have plants for you. So if you need to get plants, you need to get your vegetables and herbs. Um, we've got them for you and you've got time. Um, how much water and sun do seedlings need? Um, so seedlings, um, so if you're talking about like this as a seedling, then as much full sun as you possibly can. These have been grown in full sun. They're acclimated. They can go right to a full sun condition. Water them about once a week right now with these cool temperatures if we don't get rain. But right now you probably aren't even watering your garden um, because you're just letting in the, the, the natural rainfall do it. We, we are experiencing cool temperatures. You don't need as much. Now, if we're talking about starting from seed, um, so seed needs to germinate by a wet, dry uh, process. So you want to water your seed. Let it get a little bit on the drier side. Those top surface of the soil starts to dry out, then water it again. Uh, wet dry will break down your, your seed coating, allow the seed to germinate. Then you want to keep them evenly moist um, and in a warm location, but realizing that you're probably not going to get a ton of sunlight. Of course, put them in the sunniest room you possibly can. A lot of people will germinate your seed on top of your refrigerator, or they will get a, a warming mat, which means you might need to water a little bit more, so watch the watering. Um, but typically, it's the acclimation period that most, most people are, are concerned about, is taking them outside. So as you begin to take your seedlings outside, if you've started from seed, uh, acclimate them to the temperatures, acclimate them to the cooler nights. So bring them in during nighttime temperatures when they're cool, take them back out, work it until you can kind of feel like you're comfortable leaving it outside at night. Again, I would prefer that to be above 60 degrees at night, which we're not even there yet. Um, but if you're working them out there, then eventually you leave them out overnight and then you work them into some more sun, more sun, more sun until you're there. Probably is about a two to three week process of getting them acclimated to the outdoors so they don't get shocked. Um, Let's see. Deb said, I have been moving my tomatoes and peppers in and out. Still not planted yet. And Deb, you're probably the smartest one of all of us if you haven't planted them yet. Uh, just keep doing it. I, again, if you got to get them in the ground, you got to get them in the ground. I don't think it's going to hurt them. Um, it just They're just not going to do anything. Um, how do you keep rodents from eating your garden and tomatoes and other fruits in your garden? That's a great question. Um, there, Of course, there's netting, um, which can kind of be a pain. I have really found the most success um, if you're dealing with uh, rodents or different types of animals, um, is using a, a repellent um, around on the ground. There's granular forms of animal repellents. Um, there's also sprays that you can spray right on the plants that are completely safe for the plants. Um, that'll keep the, the, um, the, the, the critters off, uh, especially squirrels are probably one of the biggest nuisance. Hot pepper wax is, is, is sold uh, by a ready to use spray. So you can just spray that over top of the plants. And it'll add that spicy flavor that uh, most animals don't like. Um, and so you can try that. 
Uh, there's a couple other different techniques. A lot of people will put streamers and different things that move in the wind um, and make noise and stuff like that. Those will help as well. Um, it's one of those tough things that you just got to kind of deal with in this area um, is that we're going to have animals and they're going to want to eat something too. And unfortunately, it's that they take the bite and then they kind of discard it and then they go and take another bite out of another one. Um, but try the hot pepper spray, try some of the repellents, try some of the, the granular repellents work great because they stay in the soil longer and they just kind of, kind of emit a fragrance and then change it. I always recommend that with any repellent is change it. Use one and then use a different one the next time. That's why we carry multiple ones here uh, because we want you to try different ones each time you need to buy another product. Try a different one, keep that smell kind of changing uh, and that'll kind of keep them, keep them guessing. Eventually they can get used to it. Um, can I use mulch if my plant tomatoes and peppers in a long in a long container? Um, so yes, you can definitely mulch containers. I think it helps. Um, containers are going to heat up quicker, which means you can start earlier, but that also means they're going to get hotter and dry out faster when we get real hot. And mulch will help with moisture retention and keeping that soil a little bit cooler. And I think it looks prettier. So yeah, you can definitely mulch if you're in a, in a, in a container or in a raised bed, for sure. Um, Betsy asked if these products are safe for honeybees. So um, the, the triple action is not listed as being safe for honeybees. Um, so you definitely want to want to spray this in uh, the middle part of the day when they're out pollinating, but it, it's not going to have a very high residual. I definitely probably wouldn't spray the plant if it's in full bloom, but if you're experiencing some insect issues, then it's a good option. If you want to be very safe, I do have a bee safe insecticide that I carry at all our stores and all our markets, um, but you could also use um, the neem oil which is a great one. So any kind of oil product is safe for the bees. So if you know your, your plants are in flower um, and, you're, and you're worried that the honeybees are coming by and you don't wanna hurt them, neem oil is just an oil. It's gonna suffocate insects that are crawling on the plant and that are eating the plant. It's gonna suffocate fungus and disease. Um, so this would be a great safe option. And then of course I've got my bee safe uh, products at, at all of our locations. I didn't bring it here, but yes, we do have options for you. Um, it, triple action is just a great way to be preventative. And, and then most bees and pollinators aren't going to be on your plants right now because they're not fruiting. They're, they're not producing blooms. It's too cool. But if you're worried about disease or fungus setting in, triple action is a good one just to spray as a preventative rather than a curative. Um, so I hope that helps with you. Um, Betsy, I'm guessing uh, that I just answered Betsy. Um, so let's see, I had something eating my leaves and flower buds on my pepper plants last year. It's probably some sort of animal. It could be an insect. Um, there's a lot of different things that can do that, um, especially if, you're, if your peppers are just starting to form and they're fruity. You know, if they've got that little kind of fruit going right there, you know, they can get in there and eat that and start to pick away at it. Uh, flower buds, you know, some animals will eat. Um, so it, it could be an animal. I would try repellent. Um, it, it could be an insect. If it's an insect, I usually thrips don't typically get in there, but thrips are a type of insect that actually get into a bloom and eat the inside of the bloom out. Um, but it could be a lot of different things. Inspect your garden, do crop rotation. Crop rotation will help, um, be preventative rather than curative. So go out there and spray it with either triple action or neem oil as a preventative. Um, so maybe that'll help. Um, Kim would like a, so yes, the notes from, so Kim, you're asking to please post a list of the recommended products with their uses. We will do that every seminar. We have notes um, at the end. So give us some time to kind of prepare those notes. I got somebody upstairs, you know, taking notes as I talk, uh, but we will, we will definitely make those notes available as soon as we possibly can. Um, and it will list the different types of products and their uses. Uh, and again, if you've got any questions, let us know. Uh, we have lots and lots of different solutions, multiple solutions for each problem. Um, so it's very difficult for us to list every problem or every uh, product and solution, but um, we're here for you. And if you've ever got a specific question, definitely ask us, but the notes will be, be available as soon as we can. So Darshel said, I appreciate y'all doing these videos. We, we enjoy doing it. Thank you for, thank you for joining us for them. Um, so let's see. Steve said, I planted everything last Sunday in a raised garden. I am using plastic sheeting over the soil. I'm hoping to have more control over the weeds. What is your take on this? Thank you for the videos. Steve, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, plastic will heat up your soil. The downfall of plastic is it doesn't allow rainwater in. And rainwater is like the gift from Mother Nature. Um, rainwater does not cause fungus and disease issues. Um, unless we get a lot of it and it's always, you know, like it is today, but it's a little overcast, that would obviously be bad. But rainwater on the leaves isn't going to hurt the plant, but you want the rainwater to get down the soil. So that's my concern with the, with the plastic is, is it allowing your soil to breathe? If it's a landscape fabric, landscape fabrics do. 
They allow moisture to go through. They allow oxygen to go through. They allow that transfer of oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus and those different uh, gases to kind of go in and out of the soil. Um, and that's what you want. You don't want to kill uh, microorganisms and beneficial bacteria that are in the soil. And that's what plastic can do. So I wouldn't recommend if it's plastic, I wouldn't recommend it. Now, something like our earth box does have a plastic coating over the top. Now, the reason that it does is because it prevents moisture from coming in the top because Earthbox works from moisture coming up from the bottom up. Um, so Earthbox is just a, one scenario, but typically I'm not gonna recommend plastic. So if you can take that off, if it's a true plastic, it's not allowing moisture to go through, I probably won't recommend it. Um, I would probably prefer that you try a, a weed fabric, which will keep the weeds out, but also keep the soil warm. Um, and it's a great way of doing it. I mean, if you ever see a production facility or a growing facility that's growing, you know, large assortments of peppers or large assortments of, of vegetables in general, uh, they're typically going to have that weed fabric all the way down covering the entire row. They're going to grow in rows and they're going to cover it in this, in this, in this weed fabric. Um, um, and then that's going to heat up. It's going to allow the soil to heat up quicker and then they're going to cut holes, but it allows your soil to breathe. And that would be my concern with the plastic is, is, is it allowing it to breathe? Deb, thanks. She said she did learn a couple things good. And Kim said, I planted seeds in my raised bed a few weeks ago. Do you think they will germinate? No sprouts yet. Well, most likely not. And that's because soil temperature. I wouldn't give up hope. Um, the, the, the difficulty is with that, Kim, is our soil temperatures just aren't warming up quick enough. Now, the good news is you did it in raised beds. So maybe they'll warm up a little bit quicker. Um, you might try the black landscape fabric might help, but then it's where did the seeds go? Do I know where to cut the hole? Um, so that becomes a little bit trickier. Uh, I would say give them, give them a little bit more time before I would replant. Uh, soil temperature for pepper plants to germinate, at least peppers, um, is between 70 and 80 degrees. So 75 degrees and our soil temperature just isn't there yet. Um, and I doubt it is even in a raised bed. Um, so, so you might try starting some seed if you have some left over indoors, uh, where you can get a little bit of a warmer climate, uh, for that temperature to germinate, uh, or for those seeds to germinate in the right temperature. Um, but if you want to give it a little bit more time, give it a little bit more time. I just, I'm getting concerned because for your case, um, just because our temperatures are just not warming up faster. Um, and we're, we're in that, you know, 10 to 12 day range still looks like we're in the sixties with fifties at night. Um, so it's just cool and it's just remaining to be cool, which has been great. Love working in the garden when it's cool. Uh, you know, we'll all be kind of missing these days when it's 95 degrees. Um, but that will affect your seed germination. A seed germination does need a proper temperature to help with that germination. Um, my, my concern would also be, has that seed rotted because it hasn't germinated and it's been very moist. I don't think you're there yet. I would give it a little bit more time, but you might consider if you got some seed left over, starting some indoors. Um, Denise just wrote, I used a modified cold frame with all windows with good germination. That's a great option. Great, great point, Denise. Um, you know, putting some sort of, of or creating some sort of, of greenhouse effect over your soil with glass or plastic uh, will help the sunlight go in there, warm it up. There's no way for that heat to escape. So that will help. You can cover it at night might help. You know, when we get the sun coming out, um, as I'm starting to see a little bit poking out now, um, you know, when that sun comes out and warm up the, sem the, the, the temperature of the soil at night, it's going to release a lot of that heat very quickly. Um, so if you cover them at night, might help keep some of that, that uh, heat in, which might help with your germination. But a cold frame idea is very good. Look that up on the Internet. Uh, that's a good option if you got old windows uh, that you can use to cover it up and create that greenhouse effect. You might even be able to get some, some plastic sheeting and create a little uh, micro greenhouse climate. Uh, you might even be able to just create one that's small enough that you can just put over that area where you've planted your pepper seeds or your tomato seeds um, and create a little kind of a teepee that you can put right over top of it. That'll help keep the soil right in that immediate area warm. Um, so a couple different options there. I hope you're successful. Um, if you're not, we got pepper plants here, so you can always come and buy a couple peppers, tomatoes, squash, zucchini, anything that you might want for your garden. Uh, you know, we're just uh, peppers, uh, direct sowing pepper seeds and tomato seeds. We're not there yet. You can do that here. So that's a great question, a great point that brings up something. You can direct sow, which means directly planting seed in your raised beds and stuff. We're just not there yet as far as the temperature range. So typically that's going to be probably another two or three weeks, which sets you a little bit further in maturity. But peppers, you know, some people, we don't, we're not going to get peppers until July or August. You might not get them until September. We're pretty hot here in September. So you would still get a nice late crop. Um, so you can definitely direct so. Um, so I think I've got through all the questions. I hope you all enjoyed this. 
thank you again for joining us. I'll just kind of breeze through and make sure I got everything. Um, so again, ask us questions. That that's what we're here for. We want to educate. We want to continue to be here. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we'll see you next week if you want to join me for the lawn um, and the houseplant care. And then we'll continue to do this. Check out our website to see any of the topics that are coming up in the, in the future weeks and months as we continue to be here for you uh, through these crazy times. Uh, we we want to continue to educate you. And we've been in Hanford Roads for 75 years and we continue to be here. Uh, so thank you for supporting a, a local business. Um, and thank you for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day.